sorry, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'll be as quick as I can then. So I'm going to try and pull together some of the themes and discussions we've heard earlier, but I'll bring them together at the end of what I'm just about to say now. I just, just, just to want to first reiterate how serious the challenges that we face, and probably most of us have got some handle on that here. We've signed up to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade um, internationally, and the emphasis has been increasingly on 1.5 degrees centigrade because the impacts look pretty dire. The impacts are dire when people are dying at 1.1 degrees centigrade. And that's why there's been a lot more emphasis now on this 1.5, at least in terms of what we should be aiming for. Um, but when you play that out in terms of the science, that what we get from the science is the total amount of carbon dioxide we can dump in the atmosphere. And to give us a 50-50 a chance of 1.5, that's about 400 billion tonnes, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, and for well below 2 degrees centigrade, it's about double that, 800 billion tonnes. That sounds like a lot, but 400 billion tonnes is slightly under 10 years of current emissions. And even 800 billion tonnes is just 20 years. We're currently using up the carbon budget at about 1% a month for 1.5 degrees centigrade. 1% every month. That means so far this year, we've used up 10% of the carbon budget that's left for 1.5 degrees centigrade. So if you play out the, just the arithmetic from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Science, just, just the standard arithmetic, nothing fancy in this, no politics really in this. What you look at then is that the wealthy parts of the world need to be zero emissions. And this is principally from fossil fuels, zero fossil fuel use by 2030 to 2035. And the poorer nations have about 10 or 15 years of leeway on that, probably 2040 to 2050 at the very latest. And that does tell us something actually straight away about this concept of offsetting someone talked about, spoke about earlier. Under that sort of framing, every sector is gonna be up against the wall. It's gonna be incredibly difficult to get anywhere near this, but I think doable. But we will not have surplus capacity for people to offset elsewhere in another sector or indeed elsewhere, elsewhere for another country. Offsetting just leaves business as usual, um, essentially unchanged. And so offsetting it, in this world, in a 1.5 2 degree centimetre world, offsetting is part of the problem. So let's now um, sort of roll back from that and think about, well, what, what would we have to do then? And there's been some discussion already of what to, to, to deliver on this. We've had 30 years of failures so far um, and tweaking the business as usual model we have today with carbon, um, carbon markets with future technologies and so forth is not going to get us anywhere near the carbon budgets that we now face. We are going to we face a Marshall style um, rollout of low and zero carbon technologies. Those technologies being things like the retrofitting of our houses, public transport, um, massive electrification. It's much less the sort of sexy end of it, like lots and lots of big powerful EVs or lots of future carbon dioxide removal. It's much more the sort of almost the grunt technologies that allow us to live well in our lives today. But that in itself will never be sufficient. We've left it so late, it, technology cannot deliver in isolation. It's a prerequisite, but not enough. We also need profound shifts in the socioeconomic structure that we have today. I mean, Anne previously pointed this out. Um, and this is mostly this is about shifting the wealth and the resources, the labor and the resources from the relatively few of us who've done remarkably well at the system, the high emitters, not just the billionaires, people like myself here, removing the resources and labor from that, that currently furnish the luxuries of people like me to help us make this transition in the infrastructure. So it's not the old take from the rich to give to the poor, it's the argument of take from those of us who, who are very high emitters and consumers of material goods and use that labor resources to transform our physical infrastructure to be in line with, um, um, with 1.5 degrees centigrade. So this is a huge challenge. What would it look like? We start to sketch that out. What are we talking about? Well, these, these are just some examples. A quick, you know, a quick thinking about this: a moratorium on airport expansion, maybe an eighty percent cut in all air travel by twenty thirty, a fifty percent cut by twenty twenty five. No more internal combustion engine cars by twenty twenty five. A huge shift away from the private cars in the cities and urban environments towards public transport, active transport, or virtual communication. Maybe in the rural environments, you're thinking about EVs, but a rental model rather than an, owner, an ownership model. A retrofit of existing homes, um, but not just a pilot scheme, actually rolling this out en masse, street by street. Passive house standards on all new properties and also maximum sizes. You know, why are we building properties that are two, three, four hundred meters um, square? We should be looking at 100 to 150 is a very large house, nothing bigger than that. And when we sell existing houses, if they're larger than that, they need to be split up into smaller properties. That's because we need those labor and resources for making this transition. And a massive rollout on top of all of this, of course, of electrification, because um, we have to electrify most of the energy system, which only 18% of our current energy system is electric. 
the rest of it, rest of it, the other 82% is not. There are huge costs associated with this, but that's why this reallocation is really important. But the next time, well, how on earth do you get political momentum for this? This is just, you know, this is a bit like Anne was saying, this is a revolutionary shift in the norms that we have today. I don't think it's quite so hard to get them to get people behind this if we're more honest about, about this challenge with them. The majority of people who respond to the climate change will be better off. There'll be lots of high quality, secure jobs for the next 20 years doing this, doing the retrofit, doing the physical infrastructure. There'll be improvements in air quality in our urban cities and so forth, where the city around there is with lots of roads. There'll be affordable heating and homes for all those people that are now in fuel poverty. That's, no, that's not just the poor, that includes the median and the median. Um, uh, income people in the UK now. Uh, the, the, the countries would be, the towns would be quieter, our cities would be, have, have more areas for green space and for parks and so forth, for our kids and so forth, all of those sort of things there. But of course, who will pay for that huge shift, that, that, you know, for the cost for this? And that's where this shift in the labour is really important. So we know what to do in this, and we know that most people will be better off from doing this. Good jobs, great air, you know, um, affordable housing. And decent public transport, but a small group of us will have to have go. will have to go through significant sacrifice in our material well-being. We will not do that voluntarily. So the question to me is, is much less: what do we need to do? We know what we need to do. It's not how can we fund it. We know how to fund it. We have the money there, and was that earlier? And we also know that a lot of the wealth in our society is wrapped up in people like me. So the question I think really is: is how do we change it, change the debate? So it's not driven by the journalists, the academics, the entrepreneurs, the policy makers, all of whom are in the high emission category and they've completely ensured that equity is sidelined in all the debate so far. How do we get the debate to be directed by the majority, the majority who would do really well out of this change? But whilst at the moment, the papers and the academics and all the other experts here talk about this as without any real shift to business as usual, because we've liked business as usual. There's no way we can make this attractive to the majority. But if we were more honest about this, it would be attractive to most people to make the scale of changes that are necessary. But whilst, whilst the debate is dominated by this small elite group, and I don't mean the climate deniers here, I mean the mitigation deniers, um, those of us who do not want to put in place the scale of challenge that's necessary because it would mean fundamental changes to our lives. So if we could, if we could address that part of it, actually I don't think we're that far away from some sort of social and technical tipping points that could move us towards delivering, probably struggling with 1.5, but certainly heading towards well below two degrees centigrade.